on this Sunday night, a new year and the return of an old travel restriction. The upcoming requirement for some people arriving in Canada. A policy like this will not impact the COVID trajectory. Why doctors have their doubts. Rocket plan. North Korea's expanding nuclear strategy and the debate over how the South should respond. And another pointer sister forever silenced. The death of singer Anita Pointer. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight, Sonia Sunger. Good evening and Happy New Year. As we begin 2023, COVID-19 is once again prompting changes to travel. Canada is joining a growing list of countries requiring a negative test from some air passengers on Canadian-bound flights. But as Sean O'Shea reports, some experts say it will do little to stop the spread of potential new variants. Sonia, Canada ended mandatory testing for travelers coming into this country by air last April. But starting later this week, testing is back, but only for some travelers. Canadian airports are busy places this holiday season. Flyers need patience, but they don't require COVID-19 testing leaving the country or coming home. A mandatory requirement just a short while ago. But that's changing again for travelers coming from mainland China, Hong Kong and Macau. I think it's just like a matter of looking at the numbers right now. Um, the government might just think that like in China, it's really high numbers. COVID-19 case counts in those countries are causing concern around the world. South Korea, Spain, France, the UK and the United States are all requiring negative COVID-19 tests from those passengers. On Saturday, Health Canada said... In response to the surge of COVID-19 in the People's Republic of China and given the limited epidemiological and viral genomic sequence data available on those cases, the Government of Canada is putting in place certain temporary health measures for air travellers entering Canada from China. We have lots of COVID here and that's not going to have a meaningful impact. The real issue is what are we, what are we actually trying to accomplish with a policy like that? This man's father is returning on a flight from Hong Kong. The numbers um, look pretty high over there, so I guess they're just being cautious. I don't think it's like any form of racism or anything. This man just arrived from Hong Kong. Do you think it's reasonable for Canada to require people uh, to be tested? It's reasonable, totally, yeah. If you it's safe, it's okay. Travelers will have to show a negative test taken within the last two days, or if they tested positive more than 10 days earlier, be able to document to the airline that they've recovered. More paperwork. But some experts say at this point of the pandemic, the rules will likely be ineffective. We know that very focused and targeted travel measures, especially in the context of COVID-19, th th those don't have any significant uh, outcomes in terms of preventing the uh, importation of, of variants of concern. The federal government says the testing requirement is temporary and will be reevaluated in 30 days. The new rules take effect on Thursday. Sonia? All right. Thanks very much, Sean. In the U.S., big changes are coming to Congress this week. The Republicans are set to regain control of the House of Representatives. Jennifer Johnson looks at the bills and the investigations the party is pushing for. 2023 will ring in a new and tumultuous year for Congress as Republicans take over control of the House with Democrats still running the Senate. The GOP is already planning to introduce controversial bills, cracking down on border crossings and limiting access to abortions. We have strong Republican leadership ready to hit the ground running, ready to go uh, on January 3rd when we take back the House majority. Those bills are considered dead on arrival in the Democratic-controlled Senate. Continued funding for Ukraine and its fight against Russia's brutal invasion is also on the hit list. Can't keep up with it. I mean, and we're just flushing money out and uh, uh, we don't know where it's going. But before the battles begin and any member can be sworn into the new Congress, the GOP has to elect a House Speaker. We have fired Nancy Pelosi. Former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy wants his old job back, but doesn't have enough votes now to get elected. We want new leadership. We want fresh faces and new ideas. This bill takes. Some are pushing Congressman Jim Jordan for the job. Jordan will become the new House Judiciary Committee chair and is promising investigations into Hunter Biden's overseas business dealings and whether those had any foreign influence over his father. President Joe Biden. We're committed to getting to the truth, the facts. We think that's what 
the American people are entitled to. The GOP striking back after the Democrats' multiple investigations of former President Donald Trump, who may face federal criminal charges for his role in the January 6th Capitol riot. I think it's a disgrace what's happened with the FBI and with the weaponization of justice. There's never been anything like this, and it is disgraceful. Many predict there will be more fighting than bills getting passed until the next election in 2024. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. A political battle over immigration is also boiling over in the U.S. The Biden administration wants to end Title 42, former President Trump's controversial policy, which allows border authorities to expel migrants without giving them a chance to seek asylum. Reggie Cicchini reports. The barbed wires and armed guards are an uninviting first glimpse of a country so many are desperate to enter. But the endless line of migrants are assigned to those just arriving. The journey isn't over. This feels like a bucket of cold water, but we don't know what to do, this Venezuelan migrant says. She's referring to a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court to allow Title 42 to remain in place. It's a public health policy implemented by former President Donald Trump in 2020 to control the spread of COVID-19. But it allows border officials to expel migrants and asylum seekers. It has functioned as an immigration control measure. That is not what the law is supposed to be doing. Republicans argued federal resources didn't exist to lift Title 42, seeing the plan as a way to stem a steady flow of immigrants. But even under the policy, undocumented crossings were up by more than 800,000 in 2022. It is a situation where people are fleeing very difficult and deteriorating living circumstances. For those who do manage to cross, freedoms are often still out of reach. Without paperwork, many can't access shelters and wind up huddled on streets. Others have been used in political stunts, bust or flown to Democrat-led states. No one wants that for their community. No one wants that for the people that are out in the streets. Enforcing immigration policies and, and who can be here or not, that, that's, that truly is a federal issue. Bipartisan reform failed under a Democrat majority and a looming Republican House majority intends to focus on border security instead. What we really need is for Congress to act and create other ways for people to come to the country for work purposes and other needs that we have in our economy. A Supreme Court decision is expected by June 2023, extending the uncertainty for both migrants and border towns. Reggie Chikini, Global News, Washington. Ukrainians woke up to a grim 2023 after fresh missile attacks across the country. Residents in Kyiv cheered from their balconies as air defenses shot down Russian missiles and drones targeting the capital. At least three people were killed during Russia's New Year's Eve assault. And there's anxiety over what North Korea could be doing with its missiles. Leader Kim Jong-un says he wants to develop a new intercontinental ballistic missile system to beef up his country's nuclear arsenal. Redmond Shannon explains what's behind the expansion and the pressure South Korea is facing. A typical adoring welcome for North Korean leader Kim Jong-un at New Year's Eve celebrations. The spectacular show came on a day when North Korea unveiled what it called new super-large rocket missile launchers and after it fired three more missiles into the Sea of Japan. South Korea's military called the test a grave provocation. 2022 was a record year for North Korean missile tests, with around three times as many launches as the previous record in 2017. And it looks to be much the same for 2023. A New Year's Day test was followed by an announcement on state TV, saying North Korea needs to greatly increase its nuclear arsenal and that it must develop another intercontinental ballistic missile system to counter threats from the United States and South Korea. Japanese officials say this November test indicated North Korea could hit anywhere in the continental United States with a nuclear warhead. In October, a North Korean missile flew over northern Japan, triggering alarms. I know. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is now looking to double its defence spending by 2027. 
and there is a growing debate in South Korea about whether it should develop its own nuclear weapons. This past week, South Korea's President Yoon suk yeol said his country's military readiness is greatly lacking after it failed to shoot down five North Korean drones that flew into southern airspace. In recent years, Donald Trump's attempt to engage closely with Kim came to nothing and sanctions have had little effect either. It appears as though North Korea will continue to be a growing headache for East Asia and the rest of the world. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Pope Francis prayed for peace during a special New Year's Day Mass. In queste ore invochiamo la sua intercessione. The pontiff offered greetings to thousands gathered in St. Peter's Square. He also prayed for Pope Emeritus Benedict's passage to heaven a day after he died. Benedict will lie in state at St. Peter's Basilica starting tomorrow. Thousands are expected to file past his coffin in three days of viewing. Canada's MPs had plenty on their plates this year. Coming up, our Ottawa Bureau looks back at politics in 2022. 2022 was a busy year in Canadian politics, from the convoy protests that crippled the nation's capital to the Conservatives choosing another new leader. There was never a dull moment. Our Mercedes Stevenson is sitting down with the Ottawa Bureau to reflect on the past 12 months and to look into their crystal ball. Mercedes. Thank you so much. We are here in the West Block studio as we are every year to talk about the biggest stories of the year. 2022, so many unexpected stories that changed people's lives. Everything from the convoy protest that was here in Ottawa to a land war in Europe with Ukraine, the cost of living becoming incredibly expensive, a new conservative leader. It goes on and on and that's what we're here to talk about, the stories that really stood out to the people who cover them. We're joined by Amanda Connolly, who is our managing editor for politics online at globalnews.ca, Mackenzie Gray, who is one of our political correspondents here in Ottawa, and David Aiken, of course, who is our chief political Back correspondent. Back in the studio for the first time in two years. Back in... COVID kept us away from We have not... We had six-foot measurements last yes. time for one person, I think, in the studio. This time we have everyone back, which is great. Mac, we started the year out uh, in a way that will stick with, I think, those of us who covered it forever, the convoy protest. You were literally in the middle of us. It, uh, tell me a little bit about why that was the standout story for you, which is what you were chatting to me about before we started this panel. Well, really, it was international news, Mercedes. A lot of the stuff we cover here on Parliament Hill is important domestic news, but this took a life of its own across the world and became something so many people were focusing on. And rarely do we see different levels of government not be able to get along in the way that they did here. The city of Ottawa and the police really bungled at the beginning, allowing the trucks to get into downtown, and that caused a lot of problems for the three weeks leading up to the fact the federal government needed to bring in the Emergencies Act, something we spent a lot of time talking about. We'll see what Justice Rouleau has to say about bringing that in. But the other big thing that came from that too, Mercedes, was a new Conservative leader. Now, Amanda, you, of course, uh, manage all the big political stories for us online, but one that happened literally back-to-back -back right after that was, of course, the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this was a huge story because, of course, the international implications both around the world for democracies, but also for Canada, too, a country that really relies on that rules-based international order, were made so starkly clear during that invasion. So we've seen all of that playing out with the support from Canada over the past year here. Uh, certainly a big question for where it goes ahead and also what the implications will be for other countries, too, facing this risk going forward. And David, um, you know, all of these things, whether it is local for Ottawa and us, but a national protest or an international war, they register here with our political leaders, and there was a pretty dramatic change on the scene this year. There was, and that, of course, is Pierre Polyev, the conservative leader who, yes, was associated in support of the convoy, other leaders not so much. Um, we'll see how that factors into elections in the future, but I'm going to say there's some significant things about Polyev's election that politicos need to t pay attention to. One, he won by attracting a lot of people who never got involved in politics before and a lot of younger people. That could be very significant as we move to an electoral cycle. Two, uh, two things he did after winning the election, way behind the scenes, off the radar. He's overhauled the conservative fundraising machine. Even though they raise a lot of money, they spend a lot of money to raise it. So that needed to be fixed, and he's going to do that. Two, he's overhauled the computer systems that conservatives use to find new voters, voter contact, get out the vote. That system's busted. The liberals have a fantastic computer system that does that. Polyev and his team know that has to be fixed. It will cost the party tens of millions of dollars, probably take a year and a half. But I'm sorry, they don't win unless that gets fixed. 
And we did ask Mr. Polyev for a year-end interview, as we have with other federal party leaders. His team did not get back to us. Uh, we, of course, would still love to speak to him at some point when he is willing to do the mainstream media show. Is one of the big questions, of course, will be what his strategy will be next year. We'll be back right after the break to talk to our panelists about what they're expecting in the biggest stories for 2023. We're back with our political correspondents and managing editor for online politics, Amanda Connolly, Mackenzie Gray from Global National, David Aiken, our chief political correspondent. We talked about the biggest stories of last year. Now we look forward. It's, it's always a bit of a <laughs> risky game to play crystal ball in politics with what we're expecting. But Mac, what do you think is going to be the biggest issue or the biggest story that sees us in 2023? Well, I think whether or not there's going to be an election, this deal between the NDP and the Liberals is holding right now. But we've seen a little bit of a change from Jagmeet Singh. He said that it was irresponsible to go to an election. He's changing his course now, saying on health care in particular, that he's going to see some movement on the budget or need to see some movement on the budget from the Liberals. He's going to be able to continue to support them. I think Justin Trudeau is going to stick around, but does Christian Freeland stick around? That's one thing that I'm looking for. David Aiken, do you think that deal is going to hold? Is, is Jagmeet Singh serious about this? Is he playing politics because it's a good time to say people are mad at health care? Would he actually pull out? What do you think? I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm just going to look at the polls. I, I, I don't think so, but yes, it could happen. One thing about the federal NDP that I'm looking for in the next year is the provin three provincial NDP parties, I have to pay a nickel, three provincial New Democrat <laughs> parties um, could have a big year. There's going to be an election in Manitoba, and Wab Canu, the NDP leader there, good chance of being the country's first Indigenous premier. There's going to be an election in May in Alberta. Danielle Smith and her controversial sovereignty act up against Rachel Notley, a previous premier. You know, it's a tie game there. She could win that. Dave Eby, the new uh, premier in B.C., he's got some very popular ideas about how to fix the housing crisis, so much so that he's going to finish the year well ahead of his B.C. United slash B.C. Liberal um, leader. So this time next year, we could be looking at three New Democrat governments in provincial capitals, B.C., Alberta, Manitoba. Somehow, Jagmeet Singh's got to harness that kind of energy to boost his own troops. But I think that provincial capital story uh, this uh, over the next year, I think I'm safe in predicting there's going to be some very interesting stories in Winnipeg and Edmonton. I think that's a pretty safe prediction for sure. Amanda, what are you going to be on the lookout for? So I'm certainly not uh, in the camp that, that thinks so far, again, based what we're looking at, that there will be an election next year, maybe 2024, maybe push it to 2025. And the reason for that, I think, is just there is this raw anger in the country right now, particularly with younger people, generational anger over the cost of housing, over inflation, cost of living, the health care crisis, too, that we're seeing right now, collapsing systems across the country. That anger is dangerous if you don't have a plan to manage it, and I'm not sure right now that any of the parties do. David, you've been around the Hill for a long time. Three, very quickly, biggest challenges for each of the major parties, one for each. Breaking through to out of their silos. All three parties do a great job of reaching their own people, their partisans. Pierre Polyev is a great example with his social media channels to people he likes. You're not going to win an election unless you get people who are not inclined to look at you to look at you. The mainstream media used to play a key role as a commons where people came to discuss ideas and sell their platforms. The mainstream media has less influence now and it's more social. I think that is, that is one of the big challenges for all parties and for our democracy going forward is having a place where we can come and have a comment to talk about ideas. Okay, super quickly. Mac, Liberals. Justin Trudeau, does he have a second act in place to kind of reinvent himself? He's been in power for a long time. He'll need that if he wants to win the next election. For Pierre Polyev, is he the trucker party? Is that what the Conservatives are right now? <laughs> or can they go back to where they've Peter, centrally been in the center-right? Center, center right? And for Jagmeet Singh, he has a lot of personal popularity. We see that in the polls all the time. But can he harness that into votes whenever the next election Amanda, last word to you. I think really, again, that, that plan to, to harness some of this frustration in a positive way, these are, we're seeing these, these massive social movements right now, anger, frustration, threats to democracy. If you can't funnel that into a positive course of action and provide solutions, we're going to be in trouble. And that wraps it up for us. Hopefully we'll have a positive 2023. We'll find out. But those are our biggest stories from our very best political correspondents who know all the news. We'll keep an eye on it for you. And we'll be back here, of course. See you then. All right. Thanks, Mercedes. She and her sisters dominated the music charts. Next, remembering Anita Pointer. I'm so excited, and I just can't hide it. Anita Pointer, one of the Grammy-winning Pointer sisters, has died at the age of 74. 
The Four Pointer Sisters began singing together more than 50 years ago in their father's church in Oakland, California. The group won three Grammy Awards and had 13 top 20 hits in the U.S. between 1973 and 1985. Ruth Pointer is the only one of the original singing sisters still alive. Team Canada is off to the quarterfinals at the World Juniors after wrapping up the year with a win. Getting called up to play in the event is a dream come true for young hockey players. Zach Power has a story of a different kind of player who got the call weeks before the first puck drop. To play for the World Juniors, you have to be good at what you do. Resonate with the fans and end each game on a high note. Now cue Lyndon Steves. His music has become nearly as much of an extreme sport off the ice as the players have it on the ice. Growing up when I was a kid, it was, it was you know, we heard the classic organ song. I have a little technic organ and uh, I used to play on that and my buddies would come over and they'd be playing mini hockey and I'd be doing the, the intros and the, the songs for all the kids. Quite the feat. Moments before puck drop, Lyndon takes off his shoes and away he goes. A moment when a childhood dream of hearing the classic tunes brought up an octave where he incorporates tradition with the new age of music. Zach Power, Global News, Moncton. And that's Global National for this Sunday night and the first day of 2023. I'm Sonia Sunger. And before we say goodbye, we leave you with an icy tradition that requires little clothing and lots of courage. Freezing temperatures didn't stop these Canadians from taking the plunge for annual polar bear dips across the country. No water, no problem. Those without a place for a dip opted for a run. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Happy New Year.